low caste, a low caste form of enjoyment. Of all of the, the hash producing countries in the East, this Nepal produces the smallest amount and is also the most expensive. And it's also least used by the local, by the local people. It's mostly export. How long have you lived in Nepal, Roger? We've been here two years. This is be the third monsoons, the third rainy season that's coming up now. What are you doing here to maintain yourself? Uh, in what in what respect? Uh, financially and uh, in your time also, you know. Well, I've been I've been doing a, some small work for people who want to have uh, Tibetan translations, or they want to know what this means in in Tibetan Buddhism. There are very few people here who who really have any idea about what's happening. The scholars, they don't stay, they mm -hmm. come and they go. So there's no one who knows what this means or knows what that means. And, and sometimes the Tibetans themselves don't know because it's just tradition and ritual. They don't know why. And the Western question is why, not... So you, you try to help with the translation yeah, of the idea. Right. And also, mm -hmm. I've been cutting, I've been studying a Tibetan art form, woodblock show, uh, show us one of these woodblocks. This, this is very interesting to me. Well, this is one that I've, I'm working on now that... Uh, it's quite difficult. The lines are very close together. And uh, this drawing, this conception is uh, probably dates from the 8th and 9th century. Now, does, uh, does drugs play any part in uh, the culture of these people? They, there's, there's some traditional Hindu drugs. Sonam mm -hmm. is one. So, Soma. Soma is one of them. Now, these are, these are legal, uh, legal uh, commodities in Nepal, correct? Mm. And you can buy them in a market. Mm. Now, are these graded in some way, classified in some way? How is it government control? What is it? I, I really not. I really don't think there's much government c control in Nepal. In other in other hash producing countries, it's they it's pretty well regulated. Mm -hmm. But here, each farmer in the mountains in Jumla, in the Jumla area, for mm -hmm. instance, uh, a farmer will grow a plot. You know, he'll grow his other products, and then he'll he'll have an acre or so set aside, and he'll grow he'll grow his ganja, and he'll make his hash. Mm -hmm. Who smokes ganja here? Does everybody smoke ganja? Or? Mm, very few people smoke it. The, well, there's some people who don't like to smoke because it produces a, a state of disassociation, mm -hmm. which is, un, which is uh, maybe disconcerting. Bar, disconcerting. Yeah. Well, this is, this is the whole Buddhist and Hindu thing, is that you want to bring about this feeling of disassociation mm -hmm. because what you associate with, the mundane, is unimportant. Do you yeah. smoke hash? Yeah. Uh, on occasion, I, I very rarely smoke it now. Actually, mm -hmm. in fact, I, I don't smoke much hash. Actually, you have any a little ganja from time house? to time. Ah, uh, there must be some here someplace. What about I want to chill him? What exactly is a chill? Well, uh, you showed me a chill pipe a while ago. I can show you a chill him. Now those those pipes are called chillums, and uh, you you smoke that hash in those pipes, right? Yeah. Well, it's uh, a little bit is, is heated and mixed in the hand by with tobacco or with ganja, and uh, a mixture is made up and. The sadhus, they, they get very particular about it. There's some that, that use water that's been soaked in tarragon leaves. What's a sadhu? A sadhu is uh, the name of an Indian holy man, you know, uh, a, who's renounced the, the physical plane. And there's some sects of sadhus who, to the point of all is the same thing, they eat shit to prove that mm -hmm. nothing is good and nothing is bad. This is, the, this is one sect. Did you have a nice hot bath this morning? <laughs> no, I haven't had a nice hot bath in two years. <laughs> So splashing hot water on me. I'm sure that's one of the little drawbacks to living in Nepal. Mm. Americans all over the street. So what are most of them doing? Like yourselves? Um, can you tell me anything about them? Or? Uh, most of them are trying to figure out where they are, I think. They come here and there's kind of no reference point. I mean, you can look at the architecture and see that. We, uh, yes. <laughs> we know that uh, uh, drugs are legal here, uh, at least hashish and, uh, and grass. And 
There is a bit of a drug scene here, isn't there, for Westerners? I suppose you could call it a bit more of a drug scene than a bit of a drug scene, yeah. There's a lot of dope here. A lot of dope? Yeah. I mean, how does it come out? Where do you see it? Uh, the tea shops or coffee shops or something? Okay, or? well, there's, there's lots of shops around where you can buy it legally. They send out little leaflets from the king saying, buy only at the government store. People uh -huh. buy it, and they go down to the very small tea shops that are around here with blaring music and, uh, you know, just kind of a scene where everybody gets loaded and sits around all day. Is this common? Does every, do, all of, do a lot of the tourists do this, or a lot of the Americans do it? Do you think that's part of the attraction? Yeah, well, being oh, I definitely think so. And if they don't come here with that in mind, then they certainly find out about it and pick up on it soon. Have you had a joint this morning yet? No. No, you have one that's going to have one this evening? Maybe. I don't Maybe. know. I didn't plan it. <laughs> If somebody hands you one, you're going to have, uh, have a little hit, are you? Probably, yeah. Do you like smoking chillums, do you? They're okay, yeah. How do you find the grass? A little rugged, is it? Or, uh, I, mean, I don't know, I don't smoke grass. You don't? Uh -uh. Smoke hash? Mm -hmm. How do you find the hash? Some of it's good, some of it's not good. Some of it's good as well. I don't know, I don't know. Everybody likes Afghani hash, huh? Yeah. Why, is it stronger, or is it... Uh, it's just better. Yeah, some yellow. of the hash is not so good. You want some peanuts? Uh, yeah, I'll take one. Thank you. Looking for a super powerful hash? Mm -hmm. Just high, yeah. Smack? Well, like, I smoked really good grass in Thailand, and even the hash doesn't compare with that sometimes, you know, unless you get good hash. Yeah, and a lot, lots of people. Now, what's good? What do you say good? I mean, is it going to be really high? Or? No, you still want to be able to walk around. I mean, you want the strongest hash you can get? Is that good hash? I don't know what the strongest is what happens if you have shitty hash, especially many people who've been traveling, who've been on the road, and you know, you smoke a lot of hash, you smoke every day, right? And you come across Afghanistan, and you have good hash here, and you go up to, you know, Mazar, or you go... These are uh, two pieces of charis, what we call hash. Uh, they roll it between their hands, the two hands, rubbing the two hands together, so they get these long finger-like pieces, and they join the finger-like pieces in these little watermelon or cucumber shaped chunks but this is a very very strong Nepalese hash uh, how much does it cost uh, 500 uh, per kilo you know but uh, uh, 480 uh, we're selling you know 480 uh, yeah. rupees yeah rupees uh, uh, what is that uh, 60 and 60 rupees per dollar mm -hmm. About thirty dollars thirty or thirty or thirty five dollars maybe American dollars a kilo yes yeah. See. Is that very strong hash? Yeah, very no. powerful. Yeah, this is very powerful. This is the marijuana. It's packed very, very densely in between leaves of corn. Um, it looks like a very good, very good quality marijuana. Very uh, a lot, awful lot of the resin. It's very dense, very thick, and heavy. It has a lot of weight. How much does that sell for? How much money? Uh, for dollar 125 and per kilo 80 rupees. Four kilos is 80 yeah. rupees. How much is that? Uh, about, uh, about three bucks. Yeah. About three bucks. Yeah. Do uh, many people use hash here, smoke hash? Or in, in Nepalese people? Yes. No. They don't no. use it? No. They drink? Uh, well, some people uh, uh, use it. Uh -huh. yeah, uh, drink. Uh, so um, many people uh, drink you know, uh -huh. whiskey and uh, brandy and beer also. Now, how many shops like this are there in Nepal? I mean, Four shops. Four? Yeah. Are these all in Kathmandu? Yeah. All yeah. in Kathmandu. Now, uh, is it a good business? Yeah. It's a good business. Yeah. I mean, the business makes money. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, are most of your customers foreigners or locals? No, foreigners. Foreigners? Yeah. So it's a... Uh, it's like a tourist business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, does the government have any control on this? Is yeah. there a tax on it? Yeah, yeah. How much is the tax on a... For the uh, per year, we must pay 2,000 or 3,000. Know. Two or 3,000 yeah. uh, per year. For a year. For the, for the license. Yeah. For the license. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, very interesting shop here. And thank you very much. Thank you, children. Thank you for behaving. <laughs> Here. Well, I don't have any. Buddhism doesn't really offer a place for sex. I see. Some of it, is it? Uh, yeah, although it doesn't condone that you must be celibate in order to be a Buddhist. You know, it's like uh, really up to you, you know, what you do. But uh, in meditation, in order to 
attain any kind of height in meditation, you you need celibacy. Yeah. That's for the individual, you know, that's not necessary. Mahayana teachings in Buddhism are that way. Hinayana teachings are not that way. They're for the household or a person that lives with a woman and has a job and lives at home, you know. So it's completely different. But right here in Nepal, there is a man that is appointed by the Dalai Lama to teach European people Buddhism. Chini Lama? No, no. Tipton Yeshi, who is a geisha that studied in Tibet. This is Lama Tipton Yeshi from the very famous Sera Monastery in Lhasa, Tibet. He's a Tibetan, and I'm going to ask him a few questions about uh, his opinions on drugs, specifically ganja and charas, and to uh, find out uh, how he feels, how these drugs fit in the grand scheme of things, his opinions. Tipton Yeshi, uh, can you tell me uh, how you feel about uh, just drugs in general, what opinions you have on them? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the drug is, you know, some people which is no idea about nature of mind and which is wrong conception, having wrong conception. And physical and mental it identically same. Those people has sometimes helped by the taking external matter. But but my opinion does can't can't help to bring realization higher consciousness. It is not good perfect method to bring perfect peace because unnatural. That's all. Okay. Tell me, just for um, purpose of history, what were the laws for, say, narcotics and alcohol in the time uh, of George Washington in this country? Well, really, there were none. Narcotics, as a practical matter, were unknown, and alcohol was taxed, but that's about all. There were, we certainly felt that drunkenness was bad, but there were no overall laws against alcohol. In the 1920s, the first marijuana laws were introduced, and basically, marijuana bore the same relation to the Mexicans as opium did to the Chinese and alcohol did to the Roman Catholics. Uh, the initial anti-marijuana stories were that marijuana were used by the Mexican Americans in Colorado, in uh, Arizona, in New Mexico, and that under the influence of this drug, they committed terrible crimes, homicidal attacks, and generally became insane. 
And this was the original foundation for the marijuana laws, because it was felt that the drug caused crime and insanity. What do you know about the LaGuardia report? Well, after the federal law was passed in 1937, by which time about 30 states had already made marijuana criminal, uh, there were many reports of the spread of the drug in New York. And in 1944, Mayor LaGuardia of New York appointed a blue ribbon commission to investigate this. And this was, you know, the most prestigious commission the mayor of New York could call on. And they investigated marijuana, and they essentially said this is a mild intoxicant. It can hurt some people, but it is nothing to get very excited about. And, uh, you know, they refuted the idea of marijuana leads to heroin. They investigated its pharmacology and its social use. And I think on the whole turned up uh, what most people today, I think, would consider quite a pro-marijuana report. The American Medical Association wrote an editorial bitterly attacking it and advising all doctors just to disregard it. It later turns out that the Federal Bureau of Narcotics had a certain influence in planting that editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I think for a long time the federal government did all of the education in the marijuana area and generations of state officials have and narcotics officials know what they know about marijuana from the little mimeographed releases of the horror stories put out by the Bureau of Narcotics over 30 years and the training courses of the Bureau of Narcotics and how terrible this stuff is. The law is a farce. It is ridiculous and it is doing far more harm than good. What do you mean it's doing far more harm than good? Well, in just so many different ways. The most obvious way is it's turning a third of our young people in the country, and certainly in the state of California, but probably in the country, into criminals. And I think no society can last long that turns such a large proportion of its young people into criminals. Now, for instance, when I was growing up, I regarded the policeman as my friend, very simply because I wasn't doing anything seriously wrong, and he was protecting me from, you know, other people. I can only say that a marijuana user today doesn't regard the policeman as his friend and frankly is quite right because if the policeman knows that he's using marijuana and catches him, he's going to go to jail. But that's one reason. Another reason why the marijuana laws are doing terrible harm is what we've done is we've managed to give a monopoly of a very popular product to the drug culture the people who sell much more dangerous drugs than marijuana. The marijuana laws prevent any sensible kind of drug education. Now, everybody knows that drug education is the only stable solution in this area. The bureaus of narcotics admit it. But what they don't understand is that as long as marijuana is treated so grossly differently from alcohol, you cannot educate young people about really dangerous drugs because this is what happens. The drug educator goes into the classroom. He tells the students about the dangers of LSD, amphetamines, heroin, and he does his best not to mention marijuana. He does that for a very good reason. But sooner or later, he gets asked about marijuana, and then he is in a very difficult situation. He can either say marijuana is no worse over the population as a whole, in terms of physical and mental health than is alcohol. That marijuana is no more dangerous than alcohol. If he says that, he will be believed, but he will also lose his job. And this has happened. And not only that, even if he doesn't lose his job, he will then be inveigled into an effort to defend the marijuana laws, which is just absolutely impossible. In other words, the lack of credibility in drug education caused by the marijuana laws compromises the entire task of training young people to watch out for their own health in the drug area. Do you feel that marijuana is going to become legalized in the United States? Oh yes, I think it is. I just don't think we can continue to bear the enormous cost that the laws are imposing, and sooner or later the public is going to wake up to this. I think they've already begun to wake up to it, and when they do, we're going to repeal marijuana prohibition just the way we, we repealed alcohol prohibition. In Los Angeles, 40% of the felony docket in Superior Court is marijuana cases, mostly users. 
So it just doesn't make any sense in terms of a sensible allocation of resources. So people are now beginning to look at the justifications for some of these non-victim crimes. Uh, I'm certainly not one who's willing to say that all non-victim crimes are bad. I merely say that you've got to look at them carefully, and the one which is clearest to me in terms of doing the most harm in our society are the marijuana laws. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Kaplan. Okay. It's been a pleasure talking. Thank you very much. Okay, now, now where are the girls? What we want is free, legal, backyard marijuana. Very nice of you to have brought your own cheering section, and I'm sure that they've had a nice emotional bath with that applause. But we are here to get the truth, whether those of, uh, those of you agree or disagree with the uh, evidence that is brought before this commission, and we would appreciate it if you would uh, withhold your outbursts until intermission time. And